in the Paris about the uh, alpha storm from non-strange hadronic tau decays. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Is this supposed to work? Huh? And the pointer is this. Oh. OK, so thank you very much for the invitation. So uh, the topic that I'm going to be talking about is a determination of alpha s from, from the lepton, the tau lepton decays. Um, um, I have this, this little formula here in a box to remind us of the, the, uh, the interest of doing a measurement of alpha s at low energies, because it, uh, asymptotic freedom works for you, and it squeezes the error that you have at low energies by the time that you get to the z mass, uh, according to this formula. So that means that if you get a decent error on alpha s at the tau mass, you're going to get a good error at, at the z mass. And the, uh, the name of the game is to get a reliable error at, at the tau mass. So how do how you actually do this? Well, when the uh, tau lepton decays into non-strange uh, quarks, uh, it does so by integrating over the spectral functions. So. Uh, this is actually the battle horse of this talk, the existence of these uh, spectral functions. Uh, the uh, physical width of the tau lepton is given, you know, once you have these, these two polynomials. The two polynomials in here have a double zero. That's another concept that is going to be key in, in this discussion. And this double zero is what in the jargon where in the, in the jargon of the trade is, is called doubly pinched. So the more you pinch, the higher the order the zero of the polynomial that, that you have in your uh, spectral integral. Uh, experimentalists know how to extract from this integral in here the uh, spectral functions themselves locally. And this is what you get. Uh, from the Aleph and the Opal experiment. So maybe we should look at these experimental result, results first, okay? So what we see is that there is overall agreement between the two experiments, except for small regions in which you get to see a little bit of a discrepancy, like here and here. And also the fact that, you know, at the very end of the spectrum, uh, it, it seems that, you know, the Opal data wants to go down, whereas the Aleph data wants to stay up, even though the errors are so large that it's difficult to tell. It would be very interesting to figure out exactly what the situation here, what the situation is here, if we could reduce somehow the errors. Uh, another thing that we immediately see is that, uh, of course, alpha s is, is, is buried in this data, right? But there is no way we can hope to really, you know, extract alpha s just by computing these spectral functions in perturbation theory and, co and extracting alpha s. So, so we have to resort to a, to a different uh, strategy. And that goes um, by the name of Cauchy's theorem, the trick. So this is two plots, two figures that you already saw in Cesario Dominguez's talk at the beginning of the week, okay? And it relies on the fact that, you know, you know the analyticity properties of the vacuum polarization function. This is the imaginary part that we were integrating before to get the width of the tau lepton. And it, this is, you know, all concentrated on this cut. So the, uh, the virtue of Cauchy's theorem here says that you can uh, know what the integral is on the cut 
by computing the uh, contribution of the vacuum polarization on the contour. So this is uh, that, that statement written in mathematical terms. And at this point, if here what you put is the full uh, vacuum polarization function, pi of z, then this is an exact statement, OK? However, if S0 is large enough, you start believing that you know, an OPE representation for that is going to be an acceptable approximation, except, of course, really near uh, the cut, where we know that you know, the OPE does not converge to the spectral function. And this is something that we already know since 1976 due to these guys. So there has to be an extra contribution which compensates for the fact that the OPE does a poor job right next to the cut. Okay, so the, the, this piece is what I'm going to be called, what, what I'm gonna call the duality violations term, okay? Now, uh, so this, again, let me emphasize, has to do with the lack of convergence of the OPE very close to the cut. If you don't know anything about these duality violations, you could hope that maybe is a very good approximation to choose this polynomial here, W of Z, which in principle could be anything, to choose it such that it has precisely a zero at the end point, okay? In which case, even though the OPE does not converge next to the cut, maybe since it gets killed by the, by the zero of the polynomial, it's still a good approximation. But you don't know how good an approximation that is because you don't know what this pi dB does in this, in this equality. So the first step is to realize that this pi dB can actually be written like this. And there is, this expression tells you a little more about the nature of the duality violations. First of all, it tells you that duality violations are concentrated here on the cut for the purpose of the finite energy rule. And second of all, it tells you that it's something that it would completely go away if you were able to take this circle all the way to infinity. So it's something that happens only because we are talking about finite energies. If you get control over this piece, then, of course, the OPE knows about alpha S through perturbation theory, and it has some condensates, and this is the beginning of a possible analysis, okay? Now, let us look at this, at this equation, this finite energy system rule, a little bit more in detail. So it's up here again, okay? Now, let us look at the OPE contribution. So for a polynomial that has a power t to the n, say, there is gonna be a contribution from the OPE which is going to have the condensates divide, divided by the right power of S0 according to the residue theorem. So that's simple, okay? So that's how the condensates contribute here. Now, remember that pi of z is the OPE plus the duality violation contribution. So if the OPE were convergent, really convergent over the whole circle, then the duality violation piece would be exactly zero. But then we would have to have a cut, which is actually with a stops that does not extend all the way to infinity. In which case, we could expand when Q squared is much larger than the end point of the cut. But we know that the cut does extend all the way to infinity, so that's why the OPE, we believe, it is not convergent. The second thing that we can see is that uh, once we have a representation, a formula for the, for the duality violations, we are going to have a representation, a formula for the spectral function. And this formula for the spectral function contains only perturbation theory plus the duality violations that you have. And that is because the imaginary part of one over Q squared to any power is zero for Q squared positive. So that means that no condensate from the OPE contributes to the imaginary part. If you don't have duality violations in your representation, then your representation of the imaginary part is pure perturbation theory, in other words, a disaster. 
except for really very, very large uh, energies, very large values of T. What do we know about uh, duality violations? Well, mathematicians in, in the last 10 years or so have been pushing the idea that is called resurgence hyperasymptotics. And the main lesson to learn from, this, from these ideas is that the same way as in a Taylor expansion, the next term that is going to contribute is going to be a power of the expansion parameter. In an, ex, in an asymptotic expansion, you should expect an, an exponentially suppressed contribution. Actually, a tower of exponentially suppressed contributions, okay, of which this one would be the leading one. So that's mathematics. Mathematics tells you that this is the thing that you should expect. Okay? Now, again, you see why pinching in principle works. Now we can start seeing a possible quantitative you know, analysis. Because if this guy here falls off exponentially like this, and with the polynomial, you kill it at a 0, which is when it is the largest, that's why you suppress it. So now we have a more quantitative way of seeing why pinching suppresses uh, duality violations. And this was the starting point, the philosophy that the early analysis on tau decays uh, followed. Okay, and that some groups have already, you know, uh, have uh, um, you know taken all the way until today. However, there is a very important warning that I have to make, and that is, is a very important flaw in the, in the whole philosophy, which is that you can only get more pinching by using a higher degree polynomial. But if you use a higher degree polynomial, then there will be higher condensates that will contribute because you, know, you will have higher powers of t. And these higher condensates, you don't know. So, this is one of the main results that uh, I would like you guys to take home, which is that there is this price to pay. There is a sort of a, like a seesaw mechanism. If you suppress duality violations by pinching, then the dimension of the condensate which contributes to the finite energy sum rule grows. Okay? And we are talking about an asymptotic expansion. So it's an expansion in which more and more terms are going to be more and more important. What can we say about duality violations? Well, let's start with the dispersion relation for the Adler function. Maybe it doesn't look familiar the way it's written, but it's, it, the only thing that you have to do to recover the, uh, the standard way is just by integrating this function b of sigma with respect to sigma. Then you're going to have the 1 over q squared minus, minus t uh, standard. Okay? Uh, and I want to emphasize that this is exact. Okay, uh, mathematicians tell you that this is a good starting point to analytically continue an asymptotic expansion. And the reason is simple because is this uh, exponent here, sigma times q squared, is the same for sigma positive and q negative, that's to say in the Euclidean, as it is for sigma negative and q squared positive, that's to say the Minkowski. So the only thing that you have to do is consider sigma in the complex plane and rotate sigma until you, know, you can compute this thing for q squared positive starting from q squared negative. Now, the function b of sigma is going to determine what happens. Okay? If the, in fact, the analytical properties of this function b of sigma. For instance, we can already see that because the spectral function goes to a constant, for positive real part of sigma, B of sigma is totally analytic, cannot have any discontinuity whatsoever, okay? any singularity. However, the minute sigma has a negative real part, there could be you know, discontinuities, singularities, you know, branch cuts, things like this. So what I'm going to try to argue is that not only mathematics tells you that there could be these, these branch cuts, but that in fact in QCD, it's very likely, very natural, that we do have these branch cuts. So, let us see how that happens. Let us assume that the spectrum is given by an asymptotic regio-like spectrum, uh, 
for nc equals infinity. So that's, that's what the spectrum look, looks like. So it's a, essentially an equally spacing rule plus corrections, okay? With, you know, the corresponding decay constants. So that's the first assumption, which, as you know, is phenomenologically well motivated, okay? Second, second assumption is that when nc equals 3, so for finite number of colors, but very high up in the spectrum, the ratio of all these uh, hadrons to the mass is a constant that does not depend on which you know, resonance you're talking about. So there is no little n dependence in here. Of course, it has to be suppressed by 1 over nc, because when nc goes to infinity, all the hadrons have to be narrow, right? Now, with these two ingredients, a few pages of Melling transforms and, and the residues theorem gets you to this form for the imaginary part. So that's the term that you pick because this structure creates a branch cut precisely where I'm, I'm plotting here. It's, and so when you go around it, you pick up, you pick up an expression like this, which up to logarithms is exactly what you were expecting. It's, uh, you know, uh, an exponentially suppressed oscillation. Yes. It, it both. Yes, it's 1 over nc and 1 over little n. For instance, this, this formula here doesn't come out of a hat, okay? It's, it's actually it is exact in, in two-dimensional QCD. You can actually compute it, and that's what you get. It's in agreement with the, uh, the picture, the naive picture of, of strings, uh, of hadron strings, and it's also true in phenomenology, as, as Peter Masjuan, you know, showed, okay? So you just put here all the hadrons, and they seem to follow this, this type of, of behavior. But that these uh, non-perturbative things, we still have to deal with the perturbative part. And the perturbative part is essentially um, what to do with the integral over the contour of the perturbative series. So it's much more convenient to write it not in terms of the uh, um, correlator, but in terms of the associated Adler function, okay? And the thing that is going on here is that there is, in principle, a cancellation between the perturbative behavior in powers of alpha s of the Adler function and the perturbative behavior that you get after you integrate with uh, over the contour. Uh, and this determines what you can do with the mu dependence that, of course, in any perturbative expression you have, okay? Uh, you can do essentially two extreme things. One is you choose this mu here to be the same variable that you're integrating over. This is what is called contour-improved perturbation theory. Or you can choose this mu squared to be the S0 that uh, determines the radio of the, of the uh, circle, okay? Uh, the first choice seems to be a, the right choice if uh, these cancellations that I was talking about between the behavior, the perturbative behavior of the Euler function and, and the running along the circle, these cancellations did not take place. Like, for instance, if the Euler function would stop at a finite order, okay? FOPT, on the other hand, does see the cancellation, which happens to be because of the, uh, the cancellation of the uh, ultraviolet or normal on pole. And uh, if you believe in normal ones, FOPT would be the, the preferred answer. Um, since I don't really know, you know what QCD really does, uh, in this talk I'm going to be quoting uh, both results. So what was, before we entered the game, what was the, uh, the standard procedure? The, the standard procedure from the early days was that since the tau width depends on alpha s and the condensate of dimension 6 and the condensate of dimension 8, you got one input and three unknowns, alpha s, c6, and c8, so that you cannot determine anything. So in order, in order to determine something, you have to come up with more observables. 
And since you want to suppress duality violations, you want to pinch a lot. So, for instance, people came up with you know, this collection of polynomials, which have double and triple pinching. So a double zero and a triple zero in your polynomial. So that is one, two, three, four, five polynomials. So five polynomials means five um, spectral integrals. So that means that you have, uh, in a fit, the possibility to determine four parameters, right? In a fit with five things, you can determine at most four parameters. And those four parameters are chosen to be alpha s and the lowest condensates in the game, C4, C6, and C8, four, okay? So far, so good, except for the fact that these polynomials go all the way to power seventh. And power seventh means that there will be, in principle, contributions from the condensates up to dimension 16. So what do you do with the condensate from dimension 10, 12, 14, and 16? You set them to zero. You decide that the contribution from this dimension, from dimension 10 onwards until 16 and duality violations are set to zero. So essentially what is being done here is assuming that the OP is convergent. It's a convergent expansion. And this is the reason why you know, you don't have to consider higher order condensates because they are suppressed by a higher scale, by a, by a scale to a higher power. So that would be okay in, in, a, in a convergent expansion, but of course, this is not a very good approximation if we are talking about a synthetic expansion, like we believe the OPA to be. So see later what this amounts to, what effect this thing has, and uh, Kim Malman, you know, the next talk is also going to tell tell you, you know, uh, other, or other things about it. So it is safest to stay at low polynomials. You don't want, you know, contamination from higher order condensates. And the result of this thing, as you will see, is that the errors from the analysis are underestimated. So what's the alternative that we have proposed in, in recent years, okay? Well, first of all, a, a technical detail. We're gonna choose polynomials, again, but the polynomials we're going to choose will not have a term linear in Y. And this is due to work done by, by Diogo and, and company, because it happens that if, if you have a polynomial with a linear term in Y, neither CIPT nor FOPT does a good, do a good job, okay? Uh, it, so in principle, you, it's better to stay away from, from this type of polynomials. Then, we don't want to neglect any, any condensate. So all the condensate that contribute will have to appear, and we will have to be able to fit them or you know, extract them in, in, in any way. Now, we are not going to assume that duality violations are zero. We are going to parameterize them like this as an asymptotic behavior starting for, from a certain s larger than a certain s min that I will have to determine also in the fit. So from this point of view, this, the previous truncated OPE assumption is tantamount to saying that the duality violations are exactly zero, so this amplitude here is vanishing. Now, so what we do is a fit to alpha s and the first two condensates, C6 and C8 only, using a variety of weights, these three weights in different combinations, three of them together, one of them, two of them, and so on and so forth, and we determine everything. We determine alpha s, C68, all the parameters from the duality violation sector. So that means one, two, three, four per channel. So we talk about vector is four. We talk about vector and axial is eight. Okay, and we use both vector and axial, and then we do as many checks as we can, like for instance, the Weinberg-Sum rules and, and so on. So, lots of checks, okay? Uh, lots of fits, sorry, lots of fits. So only vector channel, vector plus axial, only one polynomial, two polynomials, three polynomials, and results. There are lots of cross checks, and, you know, in the uh, in the results that you obtain, and the results they are all consistent. So this is one example, which is the simplest one, right? So we just take as a polynomial one. So that means that we integrate the spectral function in the vector channel only as a function, as a function of s zero. S zero is the upper the upper end of the integral. Now, the fit determines that the, the S-min um, at which, you know, the, our duality violations parameterization uh, does a good job is 1.55. Quality of the fit, p-value, 
Um, so this is the result. So the data for the spectral function is this collection of points that I see here. This is the data. The red and blue curves, and blue is really on top of red, so the difference is whether we, we use CIPT or FOPT for, perturb for perturbation theory, is, is what you see here. So you see that it, it fits, it fits the, the data rather well. And you can also see what happens if you set the duality violations to zero. And this is the black curve. So you see that it cannot reproduce the wiggle, okay? And now we, there's something else we can do, which is that now we have alpha s, the condensate, so we also have the duality violation parameters. So if we go back to the first transparency, we have a representation for the imaginary part, for the spectral function, above a certain s mean, 1.55. So we can compare with the real data, and that's what the comparison is, right? So we see that we do a rather good job, except for these two guys, but they have a, a very large error. So, more details about the fit. So this is, you know, um, how nice looks the, uh, the, the minimum of the chi-square. These are the contour plots, plots. So here you see that, for instance, the duality violation parameter, you know, tells you that clearly duality violations are not zero. And you can even do something else, because if it is really true that duality violations are related to the radio behavior of the Hadron spectrum, then these two things will have to be somehow connected. So for instance, you can go <coughs> to the fits that people have done to the meson spectrum uh, to radial trajectories, where they get you know, the slope and, and the ratio of the width over the mass, and translate that into the parameters of the duality violation exponential uh, time sign formula that I had before, okay? So that's, those are the numbers that you would get from the feed that these people have done to the radial, to meson spectrum um, described by radial trajectories, okay? And now you can compare with what we obtained from the feed in, to tau data, and you see that the agreement is rather good. And one could say, well, this is just a coincidence, right? Many times in QCD, the minute that you have a scale which is of the order of one GB, that's the hard part, everything else is going to scale, like you know, the corresponding power of this lambda. But you see that here there is a two pi, which is crucial. And this two pi is only because you know, um, we went through all this, this business of the melting transforms and the, uh, and the analytic, uh, uh, you know, um, um, continuity, right, of the uh, analytical continuity. More checks, okay? So this is one of the classic tests. So you want to know what happens to the Weinberg rule, which tells you that the integral of the, over the spectral functions all the way to infinity should be zero. So let's first look at, at the situation when you don't have duality violations. Well, you don't have duality violations, that means that you, you're going to have data up to a certain point, and that, if that point is high enough, you are going to believe that perturbation theory takes over, plus the OPE, okay? However, Neither perturbation theory nor the OPE contributes here. There is no contribution from the OPE, you know, directly, and perturbation theory cancels between vector and axial. So that means that without duality violations, this integral goes from zero to a certain S switch, where it becomes zero all the way. So if you plot this result as a function of this S switch, that's what you get. Now, if you have duality violations, then from that switch onwards, you have a representation for the imaginary part, and the result becomes completely flat and um, in agreement with zero. There are other you know, checks that you can do, tests that you can do. For instance, you can look at you know, one of the polynomials of the um, you know, um, spectral integrals with these polynomials that you can use in the uh, truncated OPE analysis. And remember that these guys were fitting at the upper value only, okay? But since there are some condensates that are, are set to zero, then this thing is not gonna scale correctly. You expect that this thing is not gonna scale correctly as you lower the zero, and indeed that's what happens, right? They immediately, you know, diverges from the data. The minute that you put duality violations in, the agreement is, is much better. 
But you can also do other things, which is now we have alpha S, well, we have the duality violation parameters, so we have a representation, a parametrization of the spectral function, okay? And we also have the data. We have the covariance matrix of the data. So we can play God, which always feels good, right? So we play God, and we say, we're going to take a central values, the alpha S value that we obtain, an alpha S value that we choose, and the duality violation parameters corresponding to that, and we are going to let the data fluctuate according to the covariance matrix that Aleph, for instance, um, obtained, okay? And we see several of, of these data sets fluctuating, and then we take a snapshot, okay? And this is, this is the snapshot, and um, um, I would like to, to, to see which is the real data and which is the data, the pseudo data obtained uh, with, this, with this analysis. They look very similar. And uh, now what you can do is, uh, is apply the truncated OPE method to the pseudo data. Because in this case, unlike in the real case, you know the value of alpha x. And what you see is, is very interesting. If you do all the fits of the truncated OPE method, okay, in all their possibilities, and they have tried many, okay, what you find is that the chi squares are good, the p value is good, the fit value is good, everything is good except the value of alpha s. Alpha s is systematically above the real number that you put in. And it, you also get, you know, deviations from, from, the, from the real number that you put in, which, is, which are large, statistically significant, five, seven sigmas. So what that means is that the truncated OPE is, is unreliable. So what do we obtain? What we obtain is using the, the duality violations strategy that I described, are these two values for the FOPT and CIPT methods, perturbative methods in, at the tau mass, which translate into uh, these two values at the Z mass. If you compare that to the value that is being claimed by, by the other group, is precisely this 0 0.02 that we also found in the pseudo-analysis data. So these, they always find something which is 0 0.02 higher than, than, than ours. Um, you can also do the same thing with the OPAL data. This, this is with Aleph, but if you combine it with OPAL, then this would be the, the result. Okay, you can compare that to the, uh, to the PDG average value and it's compatible. Here I want to make a comment about the PDG. And that is, this is the last uh, edition of the PDG. So if you look at the tau section, which is here, you see that there are three points here, and this is ours, Boito is ours, and they take an average of these four points. But what I want to say is that these three points are actually the same point. And so no wonder they look very much the same. And they are the same, because the three of them are using the same non-perturbative corrections obtained by the by Davier. So Davier did a full analysis, so that would, I think that that should be the number that should be here. And the other two just, just took you know, the non-perturbative term, plugged it in the, their equations, and obtained an alpha S, okay? By just doing some cosmetic change, okay. essentially. Yes? Uh, do I say that the standard review value? The standard review value is an average of the above four? This, this one here, yes, is, a, is a, an average of the. It's by number, it's not an average. So, I'm using, I'm using information. Yes. Some type, of a, some type of average. Yeah, okay. okay. So I, didn't, I, didn't mean, I didn't mean a straight average. I meant some type. No, no, I didn't mean a straight, okay? But it is true that, you know, these guys weigh three times more than this because there are three. There's no weight. In the analysis that I did, there's no weight. We can talk about that. Okay, so, so then I have a question for you. If I eliminate by cuff number and pix number, this number would be the same? The standard review number would be the same? If I eliminate from these three, I just pick only the BS. 
and I neglect the other two. Well, the number which hits the river. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. So that's what that's what I mean. So my conclusions. So uh, in tell the case, okay, there are non-perturbative contributions which are important, but but we shouldn't forget that perturbation theory still dominates the non-perturbative contribution. The perturbative term is one order of magnitude bigger than the non-perturbative term. But the non-perturbative term is important because it affects the value that, of alpha s that you extract. Okay, and that. I mean, for instance, this is due essentially to the fact that duality violations are not negligible. So sometimes, for instance, you get to see you know, plots like this as an argument that you know, since uh, there may be duality violations in the vector channel in the actual ch in, and in the actual channel, but in the vector plus actual channel, you know, the data looks very, very flat. So you know, the dashed curve, the dashed line, is perturbation theory. And it looks as if perturbation theory okay, is as flat as the data, so perturbation theory could be a good job, so do no duality violations in B plus A. But that is misleading, okay? And it is misleading because if what you compare is not, pertur is not perturbation theory as such, but the alpha S dependent part of perturbation theory, so you subtract the part of model value, this is what you obtain. Now, this dashed line is perturbation theory, and this is what the data does. And what you see is that the difference between the dashed line and the solid line is the contribution that comes from alpha s, and this is the data, so the contribution that comes from alpha s is comparable to the oscillations that you see in the data. So, the algae violations are not a question of principle only. They, they actually exist in practice. So um, another comment is this, that um, pinching does not do away with you know, um, duality violations and, and higher dimensional condensates. If you suppress one, you increase the other. Okay? And this introduces a systematic error that you have to, to worry about. Okay, so uh, I presented a new strategy, which relies on, on a parametrization of duality violations that passes all the known tests. And if you guys know of a test that we didn't try, we're willing to, to try it out, see what happens. And we perform better than the truncated OPE strategy. I showed that the truncated OPE strategy has a systematic error of about plus 0.02. We have also done an analysis with E plus E minus. And because duality violations are exponentially suppressed, and in E plus E minus we can go to higher energy, we can suppress duality violations enough to make them marginal and reobtain a value of alpha s, which is completely in agreement with this value of alpha s that we have obtained from tau decays. And this is the subject of Kim Malman's talk right after this. I think that getting better data, like Babar and Bell, would help significantly. And I just you know, um, put here you know, a summary of the results uh, for you to look at. And that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Questions? Can you go one slide before the result slide? Uh, no, the one after. No, no, no. Uh, one more after. Yeah, this one. So you said that you did not find much difference when you did FOPT versus CIPT. But if I look at the results of alpha S extraction, they're not within the errors, right? Or are they? Um, no, no, just the results. Yeah, of I know, I know. I, 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 I'm going to answer the question. The two curves are red is CIPT, blue is FOPT. But that doesn't mean that the alpha S that I used to represent these curves are going to be the same. So the alpha S's are different but the two curves are the same. Or they, I mean, visually, they look the same. Another question is, um, can you go to the slide where you have alpha S values um, in the column? Um, so you're saying that you obtain a value of alpha S that is smaller than the rest of the tau decay values. Um, 
So there has been long-standing discrepancy between the alpha S extraction from low energy data and the high energy lab data. Um, do, do you think this this new value that you extract does that bring it closer to the smaller high energy extraction value, or do you have anything to say about that? Well, you can judge for yourself, right? Yeah. I mean, here, look at the numbers. I mean, yeah. it is true that you know in the old times the tau decay data yeah. was producing a value for alpha S was too, a little bit too large. But that's because it was large, and it, they insisted on the CIPT result, which is even larger. Uh, in recent years, they still insist on CIPT, but they average with FOPT, which brings it down a little bit. So that's why now it is here. Otherwise, it would be a little higher. But that's the, uh, the situation as it is right now. I mean, pending the new edition of the PDG. So I uh, just uh, maybe an EU question. Uh, so how how should I think about duality evaluation if I just work in Euclidean space time, right? In the Euclidean, right? Because in principle I have all the hadron states in some form also in in my Euclidean correlation function. So yeah. I could write a spectral representation, which is to some extent equivalent. But then then I would say that you you have the spectral. I mean, at, at very large omega or very small time, I could always, a uh, Euclidean time, I could always write an OPE, right? Where it's, it's given by perturbations. Let, let, let me try to answer. Let me try to answer the question is, how do I think about duality violations in the Euclidean, okay? Now, uh, remember this, the complex plane for the sigma variable, okay? And here there is a cut, okay? That I argued that is there just by using rigid theory. Okay, now, that so that means that This distance is going to be the, so this amount, like for instance, let me call that uh, sigma zero. This is what you know, tells you that the OP in the Euclidean is asymptotic, okay? There is a value here that has to do with the spectrum and with the fact that you cannot expand in large values of Q square, right? Because your pi of Q square is an integral dTE of Q T minus Q square rho of T. That goes, let's say, from zero to infinity. So if this would stop at a finite number, then you could expand for large values of Q. But this does not stop. So you cannot expand for large values of Q, OK? So that means it's asymptotic. If it is asymptotic, as any asymptotic expansion, should have exponential corrections. However, the piece that goes into the spectral function doesn't have to do with this quantity, but with this quantity, the real part of this thing. And this has to do with the width of the mesons. So while this controls the behavior of the OP in the Euclidean as an asymptotic expansion, this controls the behavior of the OPE as an asymptotic expansion um, in, in the Minkowski. So you see that there is a gamma over M term here, which is a 1 over NC. So there is an A over NC, as opposed to this guy. So this guy is a further 1 when NC goes to infinity. This guy is not a further 1 when NC goes to infinity. The exponent, I mean. So there is a hierarchy. If, large, if I take the large NC limit, this cat moves zoop, to the imaginary axis. So there is this dual role here. So I have a couple of quick questions. First, how many free parameters do you have in your final fit? So it depends on the fit, but let's look at the simple one. For the final results of alpha. Well, I mean, the final results, it depends on, I mean, they are, they are all compatible no matter what fit I use, but let's look at the simple one. Oops. So only B channel, okay? So that means that I have, and W equals one, um, so the uh, polynomial is one. So that means that I have alpha S and the four duality violation parameters, five. Which are related to the condensates. 
There is, there is no condensate contribution here. Ah, there's no condensate. In this case, it's, it's particularly clean because, you know, if you put a one, then the residue theorem tells you that you get a zero, right? And that's the one, so you, so why do you use different fits then? That's what it. Oh, because you want to make sure that, you know, what you're getting is so consistent. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're testing your, your method, right? For instance, several of these polynomials determine the condensate C6 and C8. And you want to make sure that they are compatible with each other. Besides the fact that they all determine alpha S, and you also want to make sure that the alpha S that you get, no matter what you use, is always the same or compatible. Okay. And so for the final result, use the W0. The, so w no, no, I use them all. And, ah, use them so, all. So, uh, for, for the final number? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't remember. I think we used W equals 1. Do you guys remember? That because one, and then we use all the others to assess the error. Okay, okay. And, 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 and vector channel only, I think. And, and another naive question I have is, you say that if you use, for instance, Babar data, that can yes. improve. But Babar is gone, right? It's finished. So what do you mean by using Babar data? Is that there, wishful someone has to do the analysis? It, it, or? It's a little bit of wishful thinking. Yeah, yeah, I would need, this is what I would need. But someone has done the analysis or? No, 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 no. So you no, have no, to get no. the Babar data? I'm just asking, you know, the heavens. <laughs> OK. No, no, this is what I need. I mean, you give me the spectral functions as precisely as possible, yeah. and then I'm in business. And no, no one from a bar has done that? No. Not that I know of. Or Bell, for that matter. But Bell's still running. Right? Yeah, 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 but they don't do it. They don't want to, um, for whatever reason, for whatever that. reason, they don't want to do this. Well, yeah. Well, but, uh, okay. It's an important thing. Yeah. Last question. So did you, th did you think about the effects of a finite strange quark mass? Is this part of the OPE? No, or? no, this is only non-strange. Yeah. No, no, but you can have um, secondary production of strange anyway. I mean, gluon splitting into SS bar, that will give you sensitivity. I mean, that depends on the, on the strange mass, right? No, 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 this is, a, no, 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 this, this is only Non-strange. S bar is strange. No, but look, look at the spectral function. The spectral function is all the hadrons with a U and a D only. Yeah, but through secondary production, you still your S S bar could annihilate. Yes. I mean, you, you are not. I think he's thinking about the type of uh, contribution that we looked at at E plus E minus the C, the charm quark contributions there. So the ones no, that e started e alpha is square. Different. Yeah. No, no, but the ones that started alpha square here, yeah. So the principle they could be there, right? It's the same. But we looked at the, we looked at the charm contributions in E plus E minus. They were very small. Remember that we did that. Yeah. So I assume it would be similar here. But so, I, so you mean that, for instance, here there's going to be KK KK bar or what? You have to tell me what non-strange means. Means that the total non-strange means that the total content of strange is zero, or that yes. there is absolutely yes. no. No, no. Total content is zero. Then you can have secondary SS bar product. Well, tell me, tell me where in the OP this is going to show up. It's going to be in the perturbative expansion. You will have a loop with strange quarks, and they are massive, right? They can be virtual. They can be real. There are strange quarks in your perturbation theory, right? Uh, is it? Both virtual and real. Virtual and real. But small compared, I mean, because you also have a. No, compared, I mean, they wouldn't affect the, the extraction of alpha s. I mean, they are smaller they than the condensate. Sorry? Smaller than the condensate. Yes. Okay. Then I'm happy. Okay. I think we we'll stop the discussion here. Let's thank Santi again. <laughs> and we'll move to the, to the next speaker, Kalman. Uh,